Let's bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. O oh Lord, we pray this morning for the heavenly light of the Holy Spirit. May it shine forth from your word and the light the whole world. Send us strength and courage that we may serve you better than we have. Open to us to work you have for our, for our hands to do. We pray in the blessed name of Jesus, our risen Lord and only Savior. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is on page 638 of the Pew Bible. It's from Isaiah 9, 1 through 4. Listen now for the word of God. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he will make glorious the way to the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exalt when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken down as on the day of Midian. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson is found on page three of your New Testament, which is or in, of the Bible in the New Testament section. If you'd like to follow along in, the, in your pew Bible, it's found on page three. I'm reading from Matthew chapter four, verses 12 through 23. So I invite you now to listen for the word of God as it comes to you in the reading of the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, uh, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You know, I said in the children's sermon that uh, I had been fishing a couple of times, especially when I was a kid, and I loved it. And when I was a young boy, about their age, my father's company sponsored a couple of deep sea fishing trips. They sponsored them for employees of the company and for their children. And one year, I must have been about, about five years old, but I can still remember it vividly. That year, I won the prize. I won the prize for catching the most unusual fish. I had caught a dolphin fish, not flipper, a dolphin fish, and I still recall its odd color and its bright speckles. It was, looked as if it had been decorated with confetti or with glitter. It was certainly striking. It was a striking catch. And the prize, and I kept it for years, the prize was a wooden cutout question mark, and it had written on it for catching the most unusual fish. Well, now that question mark is probably something the first disciples would have appreciated because in our scripture lesson today, when they first encountered Jesus, 
he tells them something really strange. He says, he will make them fishers of people. Talk about an unusual catch. What must this strange man be talking about? They surely wondered. Now, we don't know if those four fishermen, Simon, Peter, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, or John, we don't know if they even knew Jesus. We don't know if they even knew him at the time of this meeting. See, the setting of this story is Capernaum, and it's a small fishing village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was about 20 miles from Nazareth, Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, and Jesus had only recently come to live there. And it's possible that the people knew something about him already, but really, he had only just begun to preach at that time. So if news about him had reached Capernaum already, it most likely would have been associated, or it would most likely have been because of his association with John the Baptist. And you know, that wouldn't have been a safe association for Jesus because by that time, John had already been arrested by Herod. John had been arrested by Herod for insulting Herod. And that happened sometime between the last time we see John, when John had baptized Jesus in the Jordan, sometime between them and this story today. So at the time of today's story, John was in prison and John's life was in peril. Now, we can speculate that Jesus may have gone to Capernaum kind of as something of a safe haven, kind of to get away from the heat of being associated with one as scandalous as John. But if that's the case, it seems really unlikely to me that he would be approaching strangers as he does in Matthew's account today. It seems unlikely that if he were lying low, that he would be approaching strangers and speaking such odd words to them. It also seems unlikely that the words of his initial sermons would be as provocative as the phrase he spoke, repent for the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has come near. These are the same words, as a matter of fact. Those are the same words we heard from John when we first encounter him preaching in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Those were the words John used when he chastised the Pharisees and the Sadducees so boldly right before Jesus' baptism. And then remember, he told them clearly, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I. Whether these four fishermen we meet in today's lesson made that connection that Jesus was the one of whom John spoke, we don't know. We don't really know that for sure. But in light of what we do know, it's clear that Jesus had not come to Capernaum for cover. No, Jesus had come there Jesus had come there, as Isaiah prophesied, to give a clear signal. To give a clear signal that John's work was continuing even though John was in prison. And to give a clear signal that God's work was continuing. Jesus had come there to shine a light. A light that shined as brightly, as brightly as that star of Epiphany. This was a light shining to those living in darkness, in the shadow of death. And it was just as much a sign as that star. It was just as much of a sign that God had broken into the world and was doing something really new. Well, whatever it was that those ragtag fishermen saw when they met Jesus that day, it clicked. It clicked in a powerful way. They saw and they recognized something, something in Jesus, something so amazing that the scriptures tell us that Simon and Andrew left their nets. They left the source of their livelihood. They left perhaps even everything they, they even owned. They left it all and followed Jesus. James and John, who were probably a little more well-off than Simon, Peter, and Andrew, we know that because the scriptures tell us that they owned a boat. They had fishing nets and a boat. 
James and John not only left those nets, but they also left that boat. And they also left their father. And maybe even more amazingly, they didn't hesitate. None of them hesitated. The scriptures tell us that Peter and Andrew left at once. And they say that James and John left immediately. Well, think how unusual that is. Somebody walks up to you, somebody walks up and says, follow me, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And you leave everything. You leave everything behind right on the spot and you just go. I wonder how any of us would react in a similar scenario. Would we just pick up and go? Well, somehow I don't think I would have. What about you? I'm uh, too skeptical, I guess. Maybe many of us are. Too cynical. I would have to recognize something mighty special in any stranger who came up to me and said, follow me. I'd have to recognize something pretty specially to act special to actually do it. Because what I would probably say is, oh sure, I'm going to follow you, what's the catch? I'm going to follow you and you're probably in league with somebody else who's standing right over the hill and just as we get past the horizon, that person's going to probably come around and steal my boat or my car, if we want to put it in modern terms, it'd be carjacking, car theft. So what did it take? What did it take for the disciples to do that? What kind of courage on their part? You know, we might even think of it as, as foolish, as a foolish action. And certainly, certainly there was an element of risk. There was an element of danger even for them, especially if they had recognized Jesus and his association with John. It would be very risky for them because John was now in prison and John was now an enemy of the state and now they would be associating with an ally of an enemy of the state. So what kind of enticement? What kind of enticement did it take on Jesus' part? Well, I think, as I look at it and as I consider it, I think all four of those fishermen must have been really yearning, really yearning for something, yearning deeply for something. They must have been yearning so deeply and recognizing so strongly that the answer to their longing was suddenly right here before their eyes. They must have recognized that and responded so strongly that they answered Jesus' call and began a new life right away, just like that. There's such power in that story. There's such insight about the desire in people for change and about God's ability to bring what is needed to make life-altering changes in our own lives. This past week, the New York Times has been running a series of short articles, a series about short articles about contemporary people, people of our own time, who also walk away, who walk away from things in their lives that were important. You can read this online even today. Just click on uh, nyt.com, newyorktimes.com. I commend it. It's really fascinating reading. These stories are all collected under the title, I Quit. These stories were written by 20 people, all of whom who had walked away from something that they had previously prized. And these things run the gamut from a job, to playing in a rock band, to living in New York City, to cars, to buying things, to smartphones. And the list also includes things less serious, chewing gum, costly facials, skincare routines. And it also includes things that are more serious, friendships, sex, in one case, the priesthood, and even their church. It was quite a varied list, but surprisingly, 
each thing, even the more trivial seeming ones, was harder to give up, harder to just walk away from than you might initially think. And the criteria for each of them, for each writer, the one thing that each writer had in common in giving up these things is that those things were unfulfilling in some way. And those things had become a hindrance. Those things led to selfishness and a focus on something that each writer identified as preventing himself or herself from living up to their best potential and leading their fullest, most authentic life, a life of genuine truth and purpose. In each case, all 20 of these writers realized on one level or another that they were longing for something more and not obtaining it. And they realized also that they, had, that they had subverted their search for that greater thing. They had subverted it and they were now going through the motions day after day, but never getting there. Thinking that what they were doing or what they were investing their time, money, and energy in, thinking that it was all going to pay off, that it was going to fulfill that empty place in themselves. You now the four fishermen we learn of today heard Jesus' call and recognized in him that call for the truth of what was missing in their own lives. And they simply dropped what they were doing and went on the way. They went on this new way, this new way of following Jesus. Not even knowing, not even knowing where they were going. But that tells us something. That tells us something not just about the disciples. It tells us something about that call. And it tells us something about how irresistible it must have been. And how irresistible it is. It tells us something about how deep the needs were. It tells us something about how hungry these fishermen were and how compelling the answer to their needs was. And the answer to their needs was to follow Jesus, to love and to serve. You have shattered the yoke that burdened them, the prophet Isaiah wrote of this great one, this one that they chose to follow, this great fisherman who gathers up all the strange and unusual creatures, all the misfits and unfortunates, and redeems them. Surely that's what he did in an instant, in an instant with those four. And surely that's what he can do for you and me. You know, it might be tempting, it might be tempting to stop the message right here. But there's something else that this story calls us to, and it's something we can't ignore. And that's the part about being fishers of people. Fishers of people. Yeah, it was a most unusual catch that Jesus accomplished on that day. He pulled them right out of the water. Think about it. If we were looking to start a band of followers, we might consider somebody else, some other people other than fishermen. It seems an unusual choice, an unusual catch. Why fishermen? Well, because Jesus called ordinary people. People like you and people like me. Common, ordinary, working people. People going to work and coming home. Some a little richer, some a little poorer. People, though, who were desirous of being called and people who were ready, willing, and able to follow when they were called. That call to follow Jesus carries with it a promise and it also carries with it a responsibility. That call to G for, of Jesus that call of Jesus is a call to action for the fishermen to become disciples, to 
to follow and to act accordingly, to fish for people. To fish for people is to bring them into the net also. To bring them into the realm of those who are also caught by Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at the fishermen. What's the hallmark of a good fisherman? First, know the fish. Know their behavior. Second, go where the fish are. Third, give them what they're hungry for. Know the fish. Well, the fish are skittish. Maybe they're suspicious. Some of them are cynical. And the fish are of all kinds. The fish are all sizes, all shapes, all colors. The fish are black and white and brown and yellow and speckled. They want to feel safe. They don't want to be alone. Some of them are afraid of being misled, of being caught up and used, just served up for somebody else's purposes. Some have been hurt deeply and are afraid to trust. Some have had bad experiences in churches. Some may be bound, may be bound by addictions. And some just plain don't know what this whole gospel thing is about and what it means. And they're going to be slow to explore, slow to take a nibble. They may circle around and circle around for a little while, looking and coming closer and then darting away wondering if it's safe, wondering if it's real. And that's where the great patience and great fortitude of a fisherman come in. Sometimes good fishers just have to wait. Wait and remember that all the things that they are, all the things that they may be feeling, all the things that they are looking for are similar, if not the same, as all the things we are, all the things we feel, and all the things we're looking for. And eventually, they'll come to know that they're among their own kind, that they're swimming in the right school. Go where the fish are. To catch that dolphin fish when I was five years old, we had to go out. We had to go out into the Atlantic Ocean. Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee to find Peter, James, John, and Andrew. He went looking for normal people going about the normal activities of their lives. So he went where they are. He went where he could find them. You know, people may come into a church building, and that's great. But if we want to begin relationships with people... We need to meet them where they are. Maybe that's at work, maybe that's at a party, maybe it's in a restaurant, or maybe it's at the grocery store, but we have to get out there where they are. Oh dear, we might say, oh, I'm out there, no, so oh, now what do I do? Ooh. We'll give them what they're hungry for. What's that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Everything that we want and need is precisely what everybody else is looking for, too. And that is to have the yoke that burdens them, the bar across the sho their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor or oppressors shattered. And how do we give it? How do we give them what they're hungry for? Oh, in so many ways, in so many ways, in small acts of kindness, in understanding, in patience, in considering our words, in forgiveness, in being mindful, just being mindful of things that they might need. These are the things that everybody needs, compassion, respect, a sense of belonging, knowing we're not just swimming out there in the deep all alone. A sense of purpose, of being valued. And all that is waiting for them and is waiting for all of us right here in the great sea of the Holy Spirit in action on earth. And I mean by that the church. It's all right here in the church. 
if we make it so, and if we let it be so. We give what they're hungry for. In living out those vows that we made or that were made on our own behalf, those vows made in the cleansing waters of baptism, of our baptism, we give it in letting the great signal life of Christ shine in us. You know, the scriptures don't tell us what the specific circumstances were in each of those four fishermen's lives. But we know that each of those people found their fulfillment in love. In love incarnate in the person of Jesus. They saw the light of Jesus shining through in their darkness and they followed it. They followed it like the Magi followed a star. Jesus is what the people are hungry for. Jesus is what will draw them. As he said himself in the Gospel of John, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. Jesus is what's going to attract them. Jesus is what will feed them just as he feeds us and just as he feeds all of his followers. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let this be our prayer today. Lord, Lord, grant us courage. Grant us the audacity to do something so radical, so radical as to follow you and to follow that strange call. Lord, grant us the courage and the audacity to walk in love wherever you lead. Shatter the bonds of our earthly oppressors and Lord, catch us up and hold us, hold us in the bounteous grace and love that is yours. And let this be our prayer. Lord, here we are. Lead us, Lord. Help us to lead others by showing your love. And Lord, may the catch for you be abundant. Amen.